One who excels as a warrior does not appear formidable. One who excels at fighting is never roused to anger. One who excels in defeating his enemy does not join issue. One who excels in employing others humbles himself before them. This is known as the virtue of non-contention. From Lao Tzu, Tao Te Ching. The phrase, the way of the warrior, has its origins in Eastern philosophy and a meaning that is complicated to explain. To understand what this phrase entails, and hence what this book is about, let us break down the concept by their component words. The way. The term way is an English version of the ancient Chinese word Tao. The word Tao first appears in the 4th century BC text known as the Tao Te Ching, or the Book of the Way of Virtue, reputedly written by the legendary founder of Taoism, Lao Tzu. This relatively short book is one of the most influential writings in Chinese and, by extension, Japanese and Korean spiritual thought. Many scholarly volumes have been written to try to explain the philosophy espoused in the book, but to capsulize, with the resulting loss of textural meaning, one could describe the basic principles of the book as follows. The Tao is the source of the universe and all its myriad facets. It functions and moves in ways that cannot be described, but must be experienced intuitively. Through the direct experience of the universal principle, one is in harmony with nature. This harmony is called virtue. In the 2,500 years since the word Tao first appeared, its meaning has undergone some additions and alterations. Add to the original meaning the concepts of following a path, a way of living or experiencing life, a means to attain spiritual perfection, and a close association with the universal life force called Qi, an important principle in both Taoism and martial arts. The warrior. There are two standard dictionary meanings given for the term warrior. The first refers to a man engaged or experienced in warfare. The second refers to a person who shown or has shown great vigor, courage, or aggressiveness, as in politics or athletics. The term warrior is often associated with images of power, confidence, accomplishment, chivalry, honor, and integrity. This is a Western definition, and to understand the word warrior according to its Eastern interpretation, we must make a certain distinction between a warrior and a soldier. A soldier's usefulness lies in his ability to act within a group as part of a greater whole, a team player. A soldier executes the decisions, is subject to the laws, and fights the battles designated by an elite power structure. Finally, a soldier is not responsible for his actions. Moral responsibility is transferred up the chain of command. A soldier is only following orders, and thus not morally responsible for his actions. Conversely, a warrior is an individualist whose usefulness lies in his own initiative and innovation. He obeys a code of moral conduct that supersedes and may or may not conflict with the existing legal codes. The warrior makes his own decisions on when, where, and with whom to do battle. Finally, a warrior assumes full responsibility for his actions. Ultimately, a soldier is a tool of the state, and a warrior is an anarchist, someone who neither follows orders nor seeks to give orders to others. Thus far we can say that the way of the warrior is a spiritual path of being in harmony with the universe 
while cultivating the qualities of courage, chivalry, honor, self-reliance, critical thinking, and the skill to defend against and employ violence. It is the last descriptor that many people find worrisome. How can a spiritual path involve violence? Well then, the accomplished man uses the sword, but he does not kill others. He uses the sword and gives others life. When it is necessary to kill, he kills. When it is necessary to give life, he gives life. From Taquan Soho, letters to Ayagyu Mananori. The Dark Knight one reason for a warrior to have courage is so that he can face the violence inherent in this world. Nature is both beautiful and cruel. We all try to avoid this unpleasant truth. While we enjoy an outdoor barbecue, how many could stomach a visit to the slaughterhouse? We admire the graceful strength and beauty of a lion, but turn our heads when it slowly tears apart a baby springbok. While we praise our soldiers, how many want to know the details of the horrific acts they committed on innocent people for our freedom? We can run and hide from cruelty and violence, but if there is nowhere to run to and nowhere to hide anymore, who will turn to face the darkness? This is why the path of the warrior is so difficult and so necessary. Without warriors among a population, that population becomes a herd, and, like all herds, inevitably led to slaughter. There are times and conditions in every society and everyone's life where one must face danger and conquer it. Only a warrior can hope to succeed, while the other spiritual paths offer many benefits to those that follow them. They are useless against the dark side. Someone who spent years mastering meditation, sitting in the forest, would quickly find himself immersed in a world of pain, confusion, and panic the first time he is punched in the nose. While everyone can benefit from following many of the ways and means of the warrior's path and integrate them into one's own personal path, to become a warrior, one must include some practical combat training. This could range from a self-defense course to regular training in martial arts and even other sports such as target shooting, archery, and fencing. Previous experience facing danger and violence is essential. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time of war and a time of peace. Ecclesiastes Modern religions from Christianity and Islam to Buddhism and Taoism and even the modern New Age movement were founded and rose to prominence under tyrannies and dictatorships. It should be understood that the psychopathic rulers of ancient times to the psychopathic rulers of today would never allow religious movements to become established, let alone flourish, if they posed a threat to the existing power structure. History is rife with religious persecutions, book burnings, and mass slaughter of devotees. The endless bloodshed had nothing to do with God or spiritual enlightenment and everything to do with tyrants perceiving religious movements as a threat. Most religions began as revolutionary movements that were antithetical to the empire of their day and were thus persecuted in their early days. However, in order to survive, each religion adapted itself to the needs of their empires and evolved 
to support the power structure rather than preach against it. One way in which these movements adapted to tyranny is through the ideal of non-violence, but only when it suited the empire. When the empire needed soldiers, then all the religious platitudes of peace and non-violence were thrown out the window and replaced with wartime propaganda encouraging young men to murder in God's name and for the profit of the psychopaths in charge. During peacetime, the religious rhetoric returns to its pacifist default. The result is that all spiritual movements and paths emphasize nonviolence and non-aggression. While these ideals may sound ennobling, there is a glaring weakness that is the result of not understanding nature itself, that it is essentially violent. The non-aggression principle is foolhardy and self-defeating in societies that have been infected with psychopaths, psychopaths that inevitably come to dominate every power structure precisely because they have no qualms about violating this principle. While the worst specimens of humanity reap lavish rewards in the material world, the state religions tell their victims that their reward awaits them in the afterlife. Promoting non-violence as the highest principle of spiritual development is akin to teaching rabbits not to run when they see a fox. For most of us, the idea of sacrificing one's life for a cause is far easier to contemplate than killing for a cause. Religious programming glorifies those that die for their cause as martyrs, but only those that kill on behalf of the state are lauded as heroes. Those that kill for a cause, contrary to the state's agenda, are terrorists. So the common conception that a spiritual path must be non-violent is based on state and religious indoctrination to ensure their hold on power and authority. This undermining the warrior spirit has reached such absurd levels that in most countries in the world it is illegal to defend oneself from attack. Every species on the planet has a means and intrinsic right to protect itself, yet governments have denied their citizens both the means and the right. A warrior must reclaim the natural right to defend himself against both individual and organizational predation. There is another important reason why a warrior must be able to use violence that touches on the level of the spirit. In a battle for survival between two opponents, the fighter who is mentally ready and committed to killing his opponent has a huge advantage. This advantage is so big that differences in size, numbers, or weapons are secondary. In any war, the readiness to suffer and die, as well as to kill, represents the single most important factor. Take it away, and even the most numerous, best organized, best trained, best equipped army in the world will turn out to be a brittle instrument. From Martin Van Creveld, Transformation of War there is an irony in that the mental willingness to inflict violence decreases the likelihood that one would have to. This is a subtle yet immensely effective component of threat display behavior. Animals settle disputes with what is called threat display behavior. This includes showing the teeth, puffing up, raising the hair, and other actions designed to make the animal look fierce and formidable. Rarely do animals of the same species come to blows. Instead, one rival submits to the threat display of the other. Humans also use threatening displays to intimidate rivals. 
posturing, yelling, staring, stomping, and punching the air are typical threat display behaviors humans share with primates. However, a calm and cold intent to kill trumps these displays. There is an instinctive understanding or some psychic transference that all but the most intoxicated fool will notice. This message is often enough to dissuade any attack. Thus, the willingness to use violence is the best deterrent to violence. If one's opponent is, however, a psychopathic criminal who is equally intent on using violence, then only your own willingness to kill can save you. A warrior understands that humans are apex predators. While other predators prey on a limited number of species, humans prey on every species on the planet, including its own. The enemies of humanity have no hesitation to murder millions of innocent men, women, and children. Violence is an ugly and dirty business and rightly repulses good and decent people. However, a warrior must overcome his own revulsion to violence and familiarize himself with it and learn how to use it. Not to do so would guarantee defeat in every battle. The Mystic Warrior Without self-knowledge, without understanding the working and functions of his machine, man cannot be free, he cannot govern himself, and he will always remain a slave. From Meetings with Remarkable Men by George Ivanovich Gurdjieff There is another layer we should add to our understanding of the warrior's path the way of the mystic warrior. Mysticism and martial arts have been linked together since ancient times, and the resultant archetype, known as the mystic warrior, is a part of every culture. Much of the Taoist and Buddhist philosophy can be traced back to India and the yogic traditions. The Hindu writings speak of four spiritual paths, each one complex and with many variables. They are the way of the Fakir, or Hatha Yoga. The Fakir works to obtain mastery of the attention through struggles with controlling the physical body involving difficult physical exercises and postures. The way of the monk, Bhakti Yoga, or Karma Yoga. The monk works to obtain self-mastery through struggle with controlling the affections in the domain of the heart. The way of the yogi or jhana yoga. The yogi works to obtain mastery through struggle with controlling mental habits and capabilities. The fourth way or raja yoga. This is a comprehensive path encompassing all of the three previous paths. The three paths are based on the theory that humans have three brains, or centers. These centers and their corresponding paths are called intellectual, or the way of the yogi, emotional, the way of the monk, and moving instinctive, the way of the fakir. Each center has certain functions. The intellectual center is responsible for functions such as mathematics, engineering, philosophy, and contemplation. Emotional center is responsible for feeling, poetry, art, music, love, and devotion. Moving center is responsible for instinct, physiological functions, breathing, and movement. The theory that man has three centers, or brains, is ancient in origin and long associated with the study of the means towards spiritual development. Modern research into brain structure corroborates this theory. 
The brain can be divided into three parts known as the old, mid, and new brain. The old brain, or reptilian brain, the oldest of the three, controls the body's vital functions, such as heart rate, breathing, body temperature, and balance. A reptilian brain includes the main structures found in a reptile's brain, the brain stem, the pons, and the cerebellum. The old brain corresponds with the moving instinctive center. The midbrain, or limbic brain, emerged in the first mammals. It can record memories of behaviors that produced agreeable and disagreeable experiences, so it is responsible for what are called emotions in human beings. The main structures of the limbic brain are the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the hypothalamus. The limbic brain corresponds to the emotional center. Finally, the new brain, neocortex, is the most recent evolutionary development and first assumed importance in primates and culminated in the human brain with its two large cerebral hemispheres that play such a dominant role. These hemispheres have been responsible for the development of human language, abstract thought, imagination, and consciousness. The neocortex is flexible and has almost infinite learning abilities. The neocortex is what has enabled human cultures to develop and corresponds to the intellectual center. It is said that everyone will have an affinity for and function primarily in one of the three centers. Some people are more intellectual, some more emotional, and some more athletic. And those that are inclined to seek spiritual development will therefore be drawn to one of the three paths. The early 20th century Russian mystic, philosopher, and spiritual teacher G. I. Gurdjieff insisted that these paths, although they may intend to seek to produce a fully developed human being, tend to cultivate certain faculties at the expense of others. The goal of religion or spirituality was, in fact, to produce a well-balanced, responsive, and sane human being capable of dealing with all the eventualities that life may present. Gurdjieff therefore made it clear that it was necessary to cultivate a way that integrated and combined the traditional three ways. The fourth way therefore seeks to master the mind, heart, and body simultaneously. That the way of the warrior follows the fourth way can be seen in the writings of the great warriors themselves. Confucius bemoaned the loss of cultural traditions that in the past served to unite people. He felt the solution to the societal ills of his time was if common individuals, and especially rulers, were to adopt and live according to a code of conduct that stressed personal integrity above all else. The golden rule of conduct was stated simply as... Do not do unto others what you would not want done to yourself. According to Confucius, a gentleman was required to study the five arts, the Wu Xing, in order to fulfill his potential as a human. Translating the Chinese five arts into English produces seven arts as follows. Literature, history, painting, poetry, music, culture, and martial arts. Here we see the three spiritual paths. Literature and history work the intellect. Painting, poetry, music, and culture work the heart. And martial arts work the physical body. It is the warrior's way to follow the paths of both the sword and the brush. Even if he has no natural ability in these paths, a warrior is expected to do his share to the best of his abilities. From the Book of Five Rings by Miyamoto Musashi
Probably one of the greatest warriors who embodied all these characteristics is the 17th century Japanese swordsman Miyamoto Musashi. Born in 1584, the son of Shinmen Musashi, an accomplished martial artist and master of the sword, Musashi went on to become a legendary swordsman. He traveled feudal Japan, challenging and fighting duels with the most famous sword masters of his time, and winning every match. These achievements alone set him apart from the vast majority of men whose knowledge of conflict comes from movies and heated discussions. Fighting duels in which one mistake could mean death, and to do so sixty times, shows an unparalleled courage. However, his martial prowess was only a part of Musashi's warrior way, or heiho, as he called his path. He was also a brilliant calligrapher. More than mere penmanship, writing kenji is a form of art. His artistic accomplishments was not limited to calligraphy. He was also hailed as an extraordinary sume artist in the use of ink monochrome, and his paintings can still be viewed today in museums in Japan. Musashi was also an artisan and carved intricate wooden sculptures, and as a designer, he designed and carved the sword guards called Tsubas. In addition to being a sword master and artist, Musashi was a philosopher. In later years, Musashi retired to a hermitage and wrote the seminal work on strategy, the Book of Five Rings. Throughout the book, Musashi implies that the way of the warrior, as well as the meaning of a true strategist, is that of somebody who has made mastery of many art forms away from that of the sword, such as tea drinking, writing, and painting. The way of the warrior thus required not only the self-discipline of one's body, but mastery of one's mind and heart as well. He died peacefully after finishing the text, Dokodo, The Way of Walking Alone, 21 Precepts on Self-Discipline to Guide Future Generations. The Warrior as a Shaman Only the multidisciplined warrior that techno-shaman can scale the walls of ignorance and shed light over the prevailing darkness. The warrior spirit must guide this process. From the book The Warrior's Edge by Alexander, Grawler, and Morris. Martial arts have often been described as a form of meditation, a moving meditation. The purpose of meditation is to alter one's consciousness in order to achieve a variety of goals, from relaxation and healing, to extending one's lifespan and developing supernatural abilities. The picture that most often comes to mind when we consider meditation is that of the yogi, the Buddhist, and the Taoist sitting cross-legged in a temple. The key ingredients are silence, stillness, and solitude. Contrast this with the continually moving and sometimes explosive movements of martial arts, and it would appear to be the antithesis of the conditions needed for meditation. From where then did this unique concept, the linking of physical movement with an altered state of consciousness, originate? In the older martial arts traditions of China, Burma, the Philippines, and Malaysia, there are systems of self-defense that are based upon the combat movements of either real or mythical animals. The better-known styles originated in China and include tiger, leopard, lion, crane, eagle, phoenix, snake, dragon, white ape, monkey, and praying mantis, to name a few. 
Most of the movements of these styles are more complex and vigorous and are thus even further removed from the traditional requirements of silence and stillness. Yet it is in the grand ballet of the animal styles that the connection is closest to the ancient origin of moving meditation. That connection can be seen in the oral traditions. Every style has its own folklore regarding its origins. Often they are like parables that teach moral and philosophical lessons, as well as the style's origins. However, there is also a pattern to many of the tales. The following story is typical of these and contains classic story elements that point to an even older origin. In 15th century China, Wang Lang was a bully who had studied martial arts from a young age. He would strut and intimidate the locals with displays of kung fu, but the older men in the village were unimpressed. Pa, who do you think you are? They would mutter. Your skills are nothing compared to even a Shaolin novice. Stinging from such rebukes, Wang vowed to find this Shaolin temple and defeat its master. After an arduous journey, Wang reached the temple and challenged the monks to a duel. Initially, the monks ignored him, but day after day Wang issued his challenge and finally the monks accepted Expecting to deal with the master, Wang was chagrined to find himself faced with the lowest-ranking monk. Even more humiliating was his quick defeat at the novice's hands. Wang sulked off to the nearby mountains, where he trained for months. After his confidence was restored, Wang returned to Shaolin and defeated the novice monk that had beaten him earlier. However, his next opponent was a senior monk who flounced him effortlessly. Wang again retreated to the mountains to contemplate his failure. Then one day, while sitting in meditation, Wang was distracted by the sounds coming from some nearby bushes. Investigating the source of the commotion, he discovered a struggle between a praying mantis and a cicada. As he watched, Wang was fascinated by the mantis's martial techniques. He captured the mantis and kept it in a cage built from sticks. He used a straw to poke and attack the insect in order to study its fighting strategy. Wang incorporated the strategies of the mantis into his martial arts and returned to the temple. He defeated every one of the monks sent against him. The abbot finally ordered a stop to the contest, conceding victory to Wang. The abbot was curious about his unique style of fighting and asked Wang how he came about it. Wang told the story of his encounter with the mantis. Having also learned humility from the insect, Wang Lang became a Shaolin monk, and his praying mantis style became famous throughout China. As a parable, this tale illustrates three of the most important strategies of warfare, deception, speed, and surprise. There are also the moral lessons, persevering in the face of failure, learning humility, and the benefits of being in harmony with nature. However, from the perspective of cultural anthropology, such folk tales may contain an ancient memory of an even older tradition, that of the vision quest. Common to shamanism, the vision quest is a ritual whereby a young warrior first undergoes a period of training, after which he sets off alone into the wilderness. He must bear the hardships of isolation while fasting and meditating until he has a vision the vision usually takes the form of an animal that reveals certain secrets. This animal then becomes the warrior's kindred or guardian spirit and will imbue him with its powers and attributes. For example, if the visionary animal was a fox, the warrior would take on the qualities of cunning. 
An eagle would bestow far sight, a bear strength, and so on. Compare the elements of the vision quest to the story of Wang Lang, his training and initial defeat, his departure into the wilderness to contemplate his failure, the encounter with the mantis who reveals secrets of strategy and tactics, and finally Wang's triumphant return possessed with the powers of the mantis as well as a newfound humility. The folklore surrounding Tai Chi's origins also reflect the same pattern. The legendary founder of Tai Chi is said to have been a mountain hermit by the name of Chang Song Fong, who lived during the Yuan Dynasty, 1279 to 1368. He wandered throughout the mountains and learned secret Taoist breathing techniques that made him nearly immortal. Legend has him living well past 200. In addition, he learned Shaolin temple fighting from other wandering monks. One day, while living in the Wudang Mountains, Chang heard a hawk screeching and went to see what was happening. What he discovered was a hawk attacking and doing battle with a snake. Although the hawk was stronger, faster, and had superior weapons in the forms of a beak and talons, the snake was successful in driving off the hawk. The snake's soft and circular movements evaded the hawk's attacks. Chang realized that by adopting the gentle and yielding aspects of the snake's defense, the soft could neutralize the hard, the weak defeat the strong, and slow overcome fast, and thus Tai Chi was born. These folk tales share a common plot theme with the vision quest. Each includes a challenge or test, followed by isolation and hardship, then a revelation in the form of a vision of a wild animal that acts as a catalyst for the transformation of body and mind. Finally, each takes on the attributes of the visionary animal. According to his book, Shamanism, Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy, Mercia Iliad recounts that a shaman must, from time to time, perform a ritual known as the spirit dance. Well known among Native Americans, accounts of this practice also date back 4,000 years in Chinese records. During the spirit dance, the shaman moves in imitation of his animal spirit to call on its powers. It is said that the animal spirit actually takes possession of the shaman's body and gives the shaman superhuman strength. This principle is also mirrored in the martial arts. Performing the movements of Tai Chi is said to generate a spiritual energy. Qi. Like the shaman's infusion from his animal spirit, Qi also bestows superhuman strength. Could it be that performing the stylized movements of a martial arts form is based on the ancient shamanic practice of dancing the spirit? If so, this could mean that the connection between martial arts and shamanism was closer and much older than we thought. While there are similarities between the origins of martial arts systems and the shamanic tradition of the vision quest, it does not imply that practicing Tai Chi is a form of spirit possession. What it does suggest is that some of China's most ancient traditions may be the source, inspiration, or template from which the more refined disciplines, such as martial arts, evolved. If many of the martial arts origin myths parallel shamanic practices, does the Kung Fu master then resemble or perform the functions of a shaman? In his book, Iliad distinguishes the shaman from other types of religious and magical practitioners primarily on the basis of religious functions and techniques. Quote, he is believed to cure like all doctors and to perform miracles of the fakir like all magicians. Whether primitive or modern, 
But beyond this, he is a psychopomp, and he may also be priest, mystic, and poet. End quote. In comparing the function of a shaman to that of the Kung Fu masters, I'm using what could be called the classical idea of a Kung Fu master. Modern masters may or may not embody some or all of the qualities of the classical model, depending on the individual. Quote, he is believed to cure like all doctors. End quote. In the classical model, a Kung Fu master was also noted for his healing skills. Each was said to inherit from his teacher a healing method whose techniques varied from master to master, but which were drawn from the fields of acupuncture, herbalism, massage, physiotherapy, and the use of the healing properties of qi. A well-known modern example of the martial arts master as healer archetype can be found in one of China's most famous Kung Fu masters. Wang Fei Hong, 1847 to 1924, was a martial artist, a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine, and revolutionary. He became a Chinese folk hero and the subject of numerous television series and films. As a healer and medical doctor, Wang practiced and taught acupuncture and other forms of traditional Chinese medicine at his private medical clinic, where he was known for his compassion and policy of treating any patient, regardless of ability to pay. Wang passed down his knowledge of martial arts and healing to many students, such as Lam Sai Wing, who moved to Hong Kong and in turn passed it on to many more, including my own teacher, Chan Hong Chong. Like his teachers before him, Master Chan worked primarily as a healer, practicing a peculiar branch of Chinese medicine known as bone setting. Between patients, he taught martial arts to thousands of students from all over the world, breaking the long-held admonition against teaching non-Chinese. That a martial arts teacher is also a healer, is a common expectation among Chinese and other South Asian cultures. Contrast this with the Western culture, where no one, for example, would expect a physician to also be a professional boxer, or vice versa. Thus, it is shown that the Kung Fu masters in the past and continuing in the present often fulfill the role of healer. Quote, and to perform miracles of the fakir like all magicians, whether primitive or modern. End quote. In Taiwan, every Chinese New Year, Kung Fu master Zha Jian Ru would put on a public performance in this small park in front of his clinic. He and his extended martial arts family, consisting of big brothers, Kung Fu uncles, and honored grandfathers, would gather a crowd by banging on the traditional Kung Fu school drums and setting off fireworks. When a large enough crowd had gathered, Master Tsai would step out and perform his feats of Kung Fu prowess. He would cause wine bottles to explode with a slap of his palm. He could bend three spears with their blades pressed against his throat. He would have burly men break hundred-pound cement blocks with sledgehammers that were placed on his chest while he lay on a bed of nails. These and a dozen other stunts were intended to demonstrate that the Kung Fu teacher had superhuman powers of invincibility and strength. They were, in effect, miracles. But, like similar feats performed by fakirs, magicians, and shamans, most were merely tricks. Although rare today, in earlier times it was quite common for martial arts schools to put on such performances as a way of promoting their school and medical clinic, and as a public service, since they also performed the lion dance that is believed to cleanse the village or neighborhood of evil spirits. Which brings us to the next role played by the shaman. Quote, but beyond this, he is a psychopomp, end quote. 
A psychopomp is a spirit guide who helps to lead departed souls beyond the pitfalls of the netherworld to the safety of paradise. To accomplish this, the shaman must alter his consciousness and enter into a trance state. This is often done by a ritual known as dancing the spirit. By dancing and breathing rhythmically, the shaman theoretically allows his body to become possessed by his kindred or animal spirit. With the aid of his animal spirit, the shaman is able to journey into the netherworld and chase away the evil spirits that work to waylay the recently departed soul's journey to the light. While the Kung Fu master claims no such responsibility, they do, however, share a common practice, chasing away evil spirits while dancing the spirit. In the world of Chinese Kung Fu, this is the lion dance. Lion dancing has traditionally been the exclusive domain of Kung Fu schools, and it is performed at special occasions, such as New Year, birthdays, and new ventures. Like the shaman's dance, the purpose of the lion dance is to scare away evil spirits. The fact that the lion dance is required at every important occasion and that only Kung Fu practitioners can perform the dance seems to point to the traditional shaman's role of psychopomp. Finally, are Kung Fu masters like, quote, priests, mystics, and poets? The answer is obvious to any student of martial arts history. The Shaolin school was founded by Buddhist monks. Most, if not all, their masters were Buddhist monks. The founders of the internal schools were Taoist mystics. Most, if not all, their masters were also Taoist mystics. The practitioners of both schools of martial arts are thus expected to emulate the founders of their systems by having some knowledge of the mystic elements they are based on. While not every Kung Fu master knows or practices the mystical or meditative techniques, each will nevertheless testify to the art's mystic origins. Finally, Kung Fu masters were expected, according to Confucius, to be gentlemen, and as such were required in classical times to know and practice the art of poetry. As we have seen, the way of the warrior has much in common with the way of the shaman, and understanding the ways of the shaman can no doubt aid in the development of your own warrior path. It can be argued that every culture requires someone to fulfill the roles of shaman in order to complete that society's psychodynamic. In ancient China, the role of the shaman was fulfilled by the classical Kung Fu master. Long, continuous periods of peace and prosperity have always brought about the physical, mental, and moral deterioration of the individual. From Bradley A. Fisk, The Art of Fighting. The phrase, the way of the warrior, has its origins in ancient history and even prehistory and mythology. So what relevance does this school of thought have in modern society? The relevance turns out to be of vital importance to everyone, since without warriors, tyranny and slavery is the result. Tyrannies throughout history have a repeated pattern of doing everything they can to eliminate warriors from their populations. The reasons are obvious. Warriors are the ones that always stir up trouble for tyrants. They are the ones that will speak out against oppression, that will stand up to cruelty, and that will fight and die for freedom. Warriors are also the grassroots leaders around whom disgruntled citizens will gather and unite to provide a unified front against injustice. Warriors are self-reliant and not easily swayed by mob thinking 
or peer pressure and less likely to be influenced by lies and propaganda. Warriors are also trained to perceive threats and dangers and are thus the first to discover a tyrant's sinister scheme. All these qualities make warriors anathema to psychopathic power structures. Without the local leadership, courage, and critical thinking warriors provide for their communities, the rest of the population is rudderless and thus easily manipulated and controlled by the state. Warriors are like the white blood cells in society's immune system. Whenever foreign invaders or disease enters the body, the white blood cells attack to defend the body. Without warriors in a society, that society becomes vulnerable to foreign invaders or disease from the inside. As in every civilization in the past, our current regimes are doing everything in their power to rid our culture of the positive masculine principles embodied in the way of the warrior. Instead of a warrior's self-reliance, we are told to depend on the state. Instead of a warrior's courage, we are told to be in constant fear by the state. Instead of a warrior defending himself and family, we are told to wait for the state to send men, always too late, to defend us. Instead of a warrior's ability to reason and think critically, the state has dumbed down the education system to the point where few ever learn to think at all, and most people think only what the state wants them to think. However, all this is still not enough to quell the fears of the psychopaths in power. They need to eradicate the very wellspring of the warrior way, and that is masculinity itself. Through a multi-prong attack of public education, media manipulation, political correctness, feminism, and social Marxism, the state has made simply being born a male something to be fearful and suspicious of. Not only has our government education succeeded in robbing children of their intelligence and creativity, it is also robbing them of any courage. That the state has already gone so far to undermine the foundations of the warrior spirit bodes ill, as anyone who has studied history can attest. Thus, following the way of the warrior in the modern age is of utmost importance, since it is the last bulwark against total slavery. A historical cycle is not a natural law, but merely a pattern with a high probability of recurring. From the book How to Make War by Quinn Dyer. From a societal perspective, one can see the values and ideals of the warrior archetype rise and decline in popularity throughout history. The Indian historian P. R. Sarkar proposes that historical events follow a pattern he describes as consisting of four stages the warrior phase, the intellectual phase, the merchant phase, and the period of anarchy and chaos. Sarkar contends that society achieves its highest peak during the warrior phase and slowly declines until a societal breakdown occurs, after which the cycle begins anew with another new age of the warrior. According to Sarkar and many other historians, including the Greek historian Polybius, the Roman poet Ovid, and the father of modern history, A.J. Toynbee, history follows a four-stage cyclic pattern. The Four Ages Warrior This is the age of heroes with high value placed on virtue, honor, strength, courage, and determination. 
Notable activities include exploration, taming the wilderness, conquering, colonizing, and building. Crime is at its lowest, women's equality at its highest. Wealth is distributed on a meritocratic basis, and the population level recovers from previous lows. Intellectual This is the age of arts and sciences, valuing new ideas, new inventions, and new techniques. Notable activities include massive building projects, public arts, and the founding of libraries and universities. Crime is low, women's equality remains high, and wealth begins to accumulate towards administration. Population continues to increase. Merchant. This is the age when commerce dominates. In the early stages, a free market allows for some upward mobility and greater prosperity. Eventually, business dominates the political system. Crime increases. Women's social status declines. Wealth begins accumulating towards oligarchs. Population continues to increase. Chaos. Government corruption reaches such a degree that they are unable to effectively rule. There is a breakdown of law and order. Crime is rampant, women's status at its lowest point, and because of disease, warfare, and natural disasters, population declines rapidly. Wealth is in the hands of criminals. The Age of Chaos also has elements of the previous three ages, but in a degraded and devolutionary form. Instead of noble warriors, you have street gangs and police thugs. Instead of intellectual honesty and the quest for new ideas, you have orthodoxy, political correctness, and thought crime. Instead of a free and open market, you have a rigged market, monopolies, and organized crime. Traditionally, it is when a society is in crisis that the warrior archetype is called forth from the book The Code of the Warrior by Richard Fields. The Current Age Based on the above theory and examining the current state of the Western world, we can conclude that we are at the end of the merchant stage and heading full steam into chaos. Never before in history have we seen a government power reach such a degree of control. This is evidenced in the militarization of domestic police, full-spectrum domestic spying and surveillance, massive government purchase of arms and ammunition, armored vehicles, drones, and fortified checkpoints. Add to this the construction of gated communities and bunkers for the elite and the endless nibbling away at our rights and freedoms through increasing regulations, laws, and executive orders. These are the signs of a government that is ready to impose a dictatorship. What to expect? Of the four ages, the easiest to predict is the age of chaos. It seems every corrupt empire throughout history uses the same worn-out playbook on how to self-destruct. Future events usually unfold as follows. Widespread corruption drains the state of its treasury. To recover the losses, the state increases taxation, driving businesses into bankruptcy and employees into poverty. Taxation quickly becomes forcible confiscation of property, precious metals, and food. Food protests turn into riots. The state marches out their henchmen to teach the rabble a lesson. Martial law is declared, and the full array of terror tactics, from unreasonable search and seizure to imprisonment and torture, are used against dissenters. Meanwhile, the lack of government funding leaves the infrastructure to crumble. In the past, this has meant farmlands were either flooded or dried up. Crops failed and starvation ensued. In our modern world, we can add grid failure, 
no gas to heat your houses or run your vehicles, and no access to clean drinking water. Starving people become desperate and crime increases. Poor nutrition and a lack of funding for hospitals or medical supplies contribute to an increase in epidemic diseases. The state's last play is to start a war, to kill off a goodly number of useless eaters and cower the survivors into submission. Because of the dim forecast for the future, learning the way of the warrior is a practical path to follow since it will develop the courage, knowledge, and skills that will be needed to survive such an age. Furthermore, as we have seen from the historical cycle, it will be the warrior archetype that heralds a new age of peace and prosperity. The way of the warrior is not just relevant to the future, it is the future. Principle Practices The Mind In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the experts, there are few. From Shunru Suzuki, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. The warrior views his own mind as an instrument for experiencing the world, for perceiving reality, and as the ultimate survival tool. Training and disciplining the mind is as important as training the body. Critical thinking The human mind and sense organs have so many limitations that nothing can be known with absolute certainty. Understanding the imperfection of one's cognitive apparatus provides a warrior with the humility to question everything, especially experts and authority figures. A warrior does not believe anything. Belief is the state of mind in which a person thinks something to be the case with or without there being empirical evidence to prove that something is the case with factual certainty. Instead, critical thinking is the willingness to remain open to considering alternative perspectives and the skill to engage in reflective skepticism. In this way, a warrior avoids jumping to conclusions and making rash decisions, which are, more often than not, disastrous. The primary method of critical thinking is dispassionate observation and the gathering of information. Self-reliance A warrior's primary resource is himself. Depending on others is always a risky gambit, since most people do not have the skills and wherewithal to fulfill their own promises and objectives. Ask any craftsman, engineer, or builder, and they will agree that the only way to ensure a job is done properly is for them to do it themselves. To this end, a warrior is never adverse to learning new skills and techniques and, wherever possible, will employ his own mind and knowledge to accomplishing his goals. Leadership A warrior is an anarchist and therefore does not recognize a higher authority over him. Not wishing to be ordered about by malignant and or incompetent authorities, he becomes his own leader. By following the principles of moral leadership, he sets an example for others to follow. Independence Through critical thinking, self-reliance, and leadership, a warrior is naturally independent. These qualities automatically set him apart from the crowd that acquiesces to authority and blindly follows current fashions and beliefs. Standing apart from the crowd can be a lonely and isolating experience, and thus warriors have always had to learn to be comfortable 
being alone. Principal Practices The Heart All true art is in fact nothing but an attempt to transmit the sensation of ecstasy, and only the man who finds in it this state of ecstasy will understand and feel art. From P. D. Ospensky, The Fourth Way the heart of a warrior is one of righteousness, honor, benevolence, sincerity, and respect. Every philosopher throughout history have extolled these virtues as the highest and noblest expressions of humanity. Since the ultimate goal of the warrior's path is to evolve one's spirit and being to a higher level, a warrior strives to emulate and embody these ideals in his life. Compassion Compassion is the response to the suffering of others that motivates people to help the physical, spiritual, and emotional pains of another. The Latin meaning of the word compassion means co-suffering. That gives rise to an active desire to alleviate another's suffering. Many of the sages and warriors of old were healers who tended to the sick and injured without regard to remuneration. Compassion and its application, charity, are the means to exercise the heart emotional center. The guiding principle of compassion is the ancient golden rule. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Passion In order to follow the path of a warrior, one must have a thirst for experience and a desire to improve oneself. Anything less than a total commitment to the way would be futile. Mastering any skill requires a lifetime of study, practice, and patience. Without a passion for the life, there would be little chance of success. This must extend to all areas of life. For a warrior, if something is worth the time doing, it is worth doing it with passion. Art, Music, and Poetry as compassion is exercise for the heart, so beauty and joy is food. It is ironic that the way of the warrior encourages the pursuit of art, but this is in keeping with the Taoist advice to find balance between the principles of yin, the feminine, and yang, the masculine. Literature, philosophy, poetry, and culture in general have a feminine side, and Budo, the military art, is masculine. There must be harmony between the two. From Taisen Deshimaru, the Zen way to the martial arts. Art and beauty allows the male warrior to touch upon the feminine to bring harmony into his life. Interestingly, music has long been associated with the warrior. In China, playing the flute was such a common practice among martial artists that there are even forms and combat techniques based on using the flute as a weapon. In Japan, a similar tradition surrounds the shakuhachi, a bamboo flute that could also be used as a weapon. This musical instrument was so linked to the way of the warrior that it was forbidden upon pain of death for anyone but a samurai to play one. It does not matter what art form one studies, nor if one has any talent for it. The very effort of learning is what produces the benefits.
suffering builds character and impels you to penetrate life's secrets. It is the path of great artists, great religious leaders, and great social reformers. From Shunru Suzuki, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Of the three traditional spiritual paths and of the three centers, the body is often underestimated, many believing the paths of the heart and mind to be more lofty. Yet it is the moving center, the training of the body, which produces most of what could be called superhuman and supernatural powers. The body is the primary interface between the spiritual and the world. Self-control. The way of the warrior requires mastery of one's body, how to move, how to breathe, how to sense. Since the mind, heart, and body are integrated, any improvements in one center are transferred to the other centers. The self-control over the body that is required to learn such activities as martial arts, dance, or yoga is a form of intentional suffering and exercise for the will. Courage. The courage a warrior must cultivate is not just for overcoming personal fears, but the courage to live life to the fullest, which entails taking chances. Following the path of the warrior is the most difficult of the spiritual ways and requires courage to practice since you must also live life on your own terms. This means one must fight through the everyday worry, fear, sadness, anxiety, and depression to live with vitality and vigor. The following quote best epitomizes the courage of a warrior. From Helen Keller in her book, Let Us Have Faith. Security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, nor do children as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. To keep our faces towards change and behave like free spirits in the presence of fate is strength undefeatable. Nature. The final and possibly the most important practice is communing with nature. All of the Eastern sages and mystics advocated training and meditating in nature. The health and spiritual benefits of being outdoors in the wild have been known for thousands of years. A warrior should include time spent in nature in his daily or weekly routine, whether by playing Tai Chi in the park, walking along a forest trail, or bicycling along a single track through the mountains.